All right. Let's let's pray. Lord, thank you for gathering us this morning around your word. Your word is truth. And as we draw our attention to it, meditate on it, seek your will and your truth within it, you are faithful to open our eyes and hearts and minds to hear and understand, to be aware of and to recognize the vast reality that is your kingdom, that is your presence. And we pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. John chapter 1. In the beginning was the logos in Greek, or word, and the logos, or we translate word, was with God, and the word, or logos, was God. He was with God in the beginning. It's a very interesting word that's used. When in English we use the term word, we use it to describe or refer to language. You know, past participles. You remember that? Contractions. Had uh, a game that we would play and you'd fix one. Can't. Not, and then you'd have to remember where can't was. Would not, wouldn't, etc. So when we use the term word, we generally refer outside of scripture to language. That's not how scripture refers to that English word. Word. <laughs> uh, spiritually, the word of God is that activity that God is doing. So in the beginning, God said, well, Genesis 1 said, starts with, in the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. So that was in existence. He did that. But very shortly thereafter, and God said, he spoke. And then, in speaking, his word was his activity. Okay? His word was his activity. So, that starts with Genesis. John then uses a Greek word, the logos. He uses a Greek word, language, which we get the term logical from logos it makes sense it is what it is wisdom if you will logical is wisdom logic is not the same as emotion hopefully we don't make decisions based on one or the other but a balance of both so when we say in the beginning was the word, he combines wisdom and God's activity. He's doing something in the wisdom and righteousness of God. So when we read this, the written word, going back 20 years now when we started, it is a recorded deposit of God's wisdom and activity. It is the word of God and his wisdom and activity that then quickens our spirit, gives life to our spirit. That's the activity part of it. The wisdom is what guides us. So when we read God's word and... Well, going to get to it a little uh, in depth. It works within us. Jesus refers to it as the word of God is like a farmer who went out to sow seed. He usually refers to it in seed form because it doesn't come to us as a big tree. It's too much. It comes to us in seed form is planted within our minds and begins to grow 
and expand and bear fruit. Um, we'll get we'll get more into that as well. It's it, it, well another example. While we're in John, you don't have to turn that many pages. Uh, let's just go over to chapter four. Yes, I'm going to be doing this bilingually. So quattro. You're welcome. Bienvenue. Trilingual. One word here and there. So, this is chapter 4. The Pharisees heard that Jesus was gaining and baptizing more disciples than John, although, in fact, it was not Jesus who baptized, but his disciples. When the Lord learned of this, he left Judea and went back once more to Galilee. Now, we had to go through Samaria, so we came to a town in Samaria called Sychar, near the plot of ground Jacob had given to his son, Joseph. This is you know, going back 2,000 years. Jacob's well was there, and Jesus, tired as he was from the journey, sat down by the well. It was about six hour, which is noon. When a Samaritan woman came to draw water, Jesus said to her, Will you give me a drink? His disciples had gone into the town to buy food. The Samaritan woman said to him, you are a Jew, and I am a Samaritan woman. How can you ask me for a drink? For Jews do not associate with Samaritans, or another translation, for Jews do not use dishes Samaritans have used. Jesus' answer is what I'd like to focus our attention on. If you knew the gift of God, and by the way, that Greek word for gift in this particular case is the only time that that word is used. Um, other times where we translate it gift, it's different words. But if you knew the gift of God and who it is that asks you for a drink, you would have asked him and he would have given you living water. That's another reference to his teaching. It's not just teaching as we understand teaching by way of information. His teaching is life because it's word. He refers to this time and again uh, um, in John, but let's go on. Sir, the woman said in verse 11, you have nothing to draw with and the well is deep. Where can you get this living water? Now, she's now going to the physical. Most of our mind in terms of its um, ability to engage is directed and attached to the physical. If I asked you, would you please define for me or describe a table, you would probably be able to do so. If I asked you, define for me the glory of God, I might get head scratched. Hmm, well, what does that mean? Define righteousness. These are terms that we use that, def that, are, that help give uh, insight into spiritual reality, but they don't fit physical reality. God has to reveal it, and he reveals it by way of our journey. But we'll go on. So you've nothing to draw with in verse 11. The well's deep. Where can you get this living water? Are you greater than our father Jacob who gave us the well and drank from it himself as it also his sons and flocks and herds? You wait, where are you going to find this water? This is it. By the way, this is an incredible well. For 2,000 years, um, it's given us water. And not only did Jacob discover it, and, 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 and dig there, which is quite an accomplishment if you live in a desert, or even if you don't live in a desert. Um, to find a well is, is uh, I asked my grandma how they did that. It was a, uh, was that switch? Yeah. Yeah, how do you do, well, I, they don't do that anymore. They got sonar and all this stuff, but back then, and to, the, to, to this day, that, that well still works, or still pumps out water. Are you greater than Jacob then? And, and for the last 2,000 years, we've been drinking of it. And when he discovered it, he drank from it. His kids drank from it. His it's, a, it's a substantial well. 
You're talking about living water. This is a substantial well. Are you, are you greater than that? So she's drawing attention again to the physical. She's, she's in the conversation dealing with physical. Jesus answered, everyone who drinks this water will be thirsty again, but whoever drinks the water I give him will never thirst. Indeed, the water I give him will become in him, just like a, like a seed, a spring of water welling up to eternal life. The woman said to him, sir, give me this water so that I won't get thirsty and have to keep coming here to draw water. Go call your husband and come back, he said. I have no husband, she replied. Jesus said to her, you are right when you say you have no husband. The fact is you've had five husbands and the man you now have is not your husband. What you have just said is quite true. So he moves the discussion from this objective physical reality to a personal engagement, of which makes her feel very uncomfortable. Sir, the woman said, I can see that you, well, it's, that's just a common reality. It's much easier to come into church sitting around here and talk about our week as compared to spiritual reality. It's just, un, it's, it's just, it's more sensitive in general. Um, it's foreign. You don't talk about it on a regular basis. And talk about the price of gas. It's very comfortable, right? The, the, the tires that I need to be replaced is very comfortable. But spiritual, I was just uh, getting my coffee this morning. And my friend Steve, who's um, just got done um, celebrating Jesus' birth, the, the actual, the, a small group. And today, this Wednesday, they're celebrating his um, uh, presentation at the temple, um, which is very interesting. But he was sitting around a, a, a older group, and he came. And he goes, "I got, I got to have to, I have to be able to talk about something more than foreclosures and repossessions, because that's all they were talking about. Very easy to talk about the price of housing and oh, the inflation. That's 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 common uh, discussion. But talking about spiritual matters is ah, different, d- difficult at best." What is it that you're not supposed to talk about in public? And who told you that? Culture, yeah. Because there's a sensitivity of it. You don't want to flare up things. So this is what's taking place here. I can see you're a prophet, she says in verse 19. Our father, now she <laughs> goes back to the differences between Jews and Samaritans. Our fathers worshiped on this mountain, but you Jews claim that the place where we must worship is in Jerusalem. Believe me, Jesus declared, believe me, woman, trust me, a time is coming when you will worship the Father neither on this mountain nor in Jerusalem. Now he's shifting from the physical to the spiritual. He goes on. You Samaritans worship what you do not know. We worship what we do know, for salvation is from the Jews. The Samaritan scriptures were the first five books, and then they stopped. So Moses gave the blessing and the curses on two different mountains as Joshua went into the promised land. Mount Ebal was one of those mountains of which the Samaritans Um, claimed was a sacred place, and that's where they would worship. The Jews, continuing with Israel's history, followed through when David brought the tabernacle to Jerusalem, and then later Solomon built a temple to to be the, the tabernacle of God in permanent form in Jerusalem. And so Jews say, this is where you must worship. This is what she's bringing in. She's bringing in the difference of theology. So it goes to physical, then Jesus brings it to the spiritual, then she brings it to the difference of our spiritual interpretation and history. He then comes in and continues, yet a time is coming and has now come when the true worshipers will worship the Father in spirit and truth, for they are the kind of worshipers the Father seeks. God is spirit. You cannot see God. We can't use language to describe 
God if we use language that is primarily designed to uh, deal with the physical. Do you remember growing up and um, uh, your first words? Uh, the Dick and Jane books? Did, did, was that? Yeah. I don't know when, when, when all that came in. But you had three letter words. Run. Spawn. Um, C, right? Dog. C, Dick, run. But it's all physical. Before those textbooks came in, the textbook that was commonly used was the Bible. So you were already exposed to spiritual language. I'm just from a cultural standpoint. So Jesus here is moving it back into a spiritual reality. God is spirit, and those who worship him must worship in spirit and truth. The woman said, I know that Messiah called Christ is coming. When he comes, he will explain everything to us. Then Jesus declared, I who speak to you am he. That's a very big, you don't throw that card out. He doesn't throw that card out very often. He uses son of man to be intentionally and deliberately ambiguous. Just making sure my mic is on or I'm going to have to repeat the last half hour. Why? So that they don't put him into a Messiah as a physical, uh, has physical definitions to him. It's a man. He's going to come here. He's going to do this. He's going to look this way. He's going to act this way. He's going to do these things. He doesn't use the term. Son of man can be, if you look through the prophets, of a wide variety of people and coming from a wide variety of life situations in a, in a wide variety of times and historical settings um, and, and, and speaking on behalf of God, but you can't pin them down. They're not, the sa- they're not always the same. Jeremiah, uh, he was he, very much so a, um, a person of the palace. So was Ezekiel. Um, not Amos. Mm-mm. Farmer. So he uses this term. This he comes and says, I who speak to you am he. Just then his disciples returned and were surprised to find him talking with a woman, but no one asked, what do you want or why are you talking with her? Then, leaving her water jar, the woman went back to the town and said to the people, come see a man who told me everything I ever did. Could this be the Messiah or Christ? They came out of the town and made their way toward him. Meanwhile, his disciples urged him, Rabbi, eat something But he said to them, I have food to eat that you know nothing about. He once again is putting the spiritual in its proper place. The spiritual is the foundation of the universe, not the physical. The serpent uses the physical to entice the human being away from their spiritual vocation and entraps them in one dimension of the physical. How much time do you spend thinking about the physical reality of your life versus the spiritual? And there you have it. A lot. So, he is putting things, and of course they don't understand. What do you mean? Could they, they even say, my food, um, or for, I have food to eat, you know nothing about. Then his disciples said to each other, could someone have brought him food? My food, said Jesus, is to do the will of him who sent me and to finish his work. That's my food. That's what nourishes me. The spiritual vocation first. It's not a negation of the physical reality. It's simply putting it in its proper perspective. So I'm going to leave it at that. Just wanted to point out it's not the first time he does that. He does that with with, with bread. Um, 
you know, let while we're there, just turn over to chapter 6. Chapter 6, verse 53. Verse 53, Jesus said to them, I tell you the truth, unless you eat the flesh of the Son of Man, there again he goes back to the more ambiguous term, and drink his blood, you have no life in you. That, that's very offensive, by the way, to Jews. Whoever eats my flesh and drinks my blood has eternal life, and I will raise him up at the last day. And, of course, this is very offensive. And he's doing that intentionally, because when you take a look at verse 61, aware that his disciples were grumbling about this, Jesus said to them, what, does this offend you? You offended? What if you see the Son of Man ascend to where he was before? Now, when you imagine that happening, on the scale of believability, one being that, uh, ten being okay, but it, or ten being, yeah, I know that. It's hard to imagine it. Can, can you imagine whatever, six jars, stone jars of water being turned to wine. Yeah, I could see that, right? I put that as an eight, okay? Can you see the bread, the five loaves feeding 5,000? Yeah, I can. It's a strap. I can see that. Can you see him walking on water? Oh, man, I, that's, uh. How about ascending to where he was before? This is the, the levels of what our imagination has been conditioned in the physical. It's not that difficult to imagine someone going in and out of the spiritual and the physical if there's a complete awareness of the spiritual. Jesus says in his, um, on his trial... There's 10,000 angels that are ready to fight for me. Uh Uh-huh. Yeah, it looks like it. Yeah, they're everywhere. Well, is that true or not? So this is a hard, it's hard for the, Paul uses, uses the term the mind of the flesh to grasp it because the mind of the flesh has been sedu- part of sin's seduction is to seduce you into only being able to function and to and to realize and to perceive the physical. That's it. Remember uh, God saying to Cain, "Careful, be very careful. Sin is crouching at your door." and it desires to own you, to have you. It's a slavery term. It, it, it will direct your will. It will direct how you feel. It will own you. You have no ability to choose any longer. And this is a very, um, a very uh, profound reality of bringing together the heavenly and the earthly back to its original, intentional reality. Not supposed to be like this. This is is not a good place to be. Very hard life. It's a very painful life. And if you are um, physically blessed and very prosperous, it can easily uh, become a very shallow and superficial life. That's the danger that Jesus gave with the rich man. Riches aren't inherently bad at all, but they can be extremely seductive. And his warning was, you know, it's easier for a camel to go through that than it is for a rich man. 
Because rich men only talk about physical things. Think of your life and how many people are very physically prosperous and what dominates their conversation. Foreclosures like my friends that have money that own 50 different homes in Rancho Cordova. Okay, but that's, his, that's what he lives for. And he's been very prosperous. But he can't move be out of, beyond that conversation. Generally, couples that are very successful don't pray together. Not intentionally, not bad people. It's just, it's the seduction of the physical. It, so, um, I, I can't. Uh, yeah, and it's not, again, we don't want to fall into the dichotomy because here's the Beatitudes. Blessed are you who are poor. Well, being poor is not necessarily a blessing. It's, it's just not, not physically. The blessing is that even in your state of being poor, you have access to the kingdom. That's the blessing. As compared to thinking that only rich people have access to God because the thinking is, if God loves me, he'll bless me in this way. Or the other dichotomy is rich people are bad people. Well, no, it's not. It's just, it's an understanding of the spiritual and the relationship between the spiritual and the physical. Do you, oh, here's a great one. You, this happens all the time. It's a great example. You ever get really excited about the possibility of something physical for um, a five-year-old, the Christmas present, right? And for weeks, I remember doing I'd open up the uh, Sears catalog. Remember those? Do you know where all the toys were? Right in the back. Ooh. Ooh. And then if you got one, Ooh, 10 minutes later, what's on TV? That's the physical. That's the physical. It, 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 it promises this, this spiritual, and it's exciting. It's life-giving. <sighs> but it's temporal, and it can never fulfill the spiritual. Jesus says, if you drink what I'm giving you, you won't be thirsty again like you will in the physical. So, it's not just that. It's um, everything. The first time, ah, uh, first time we're going drinking, 21, right? And then after a while, oh, that's just boring. But not at first. So, that this is the nature of the physical. It, it gives this and then it, lets you down and the, the spiritual is eternal the words i speak to you are spirit they are life um since we're in john we might as well uh go over there um let's go to uh um back to, to chapter six actually we yeah, let's take a look at chapter 6 again. Um, we, we left off, or we're right around chapter, or verse 61. Aware that his disciples were grumbling about this, Jesus said to them, does this offend you? What if you see the Son of Man ascend to where he was before? That would be a pretty strong sight. The Spirit gives life. Flesh counts for nothing. Do you, do you have any other translation than that? Okay. The spirit gives life, the flesh counts for nothing. The words I have spoken to you are spirit and they are life. So when I speak them, as you take them to heart and meditate on them, allow them to go deeper in the same way that you ingest, digest, eat food or whatever for nourishment, as you're doing this spiritually, it will revitalize you. But... 
it will not feel at times like a revitalization because as the spirit is growing, the flesh is dying. So it doesn't feel good. Oh, I hear these words of encouragement and hope, and then God gives me this situation, and the situation feels disappointing, discouraging, despairing. That's because that mind is dying, and a new mind is arising. You, t- t- a mind not of the flesh, a mind of the spirit. in its proper order. So, so when Jesus offers himself, he puts things in its proper order. The physical is subject to or um, should be in alignment to the spiritual first. He practiced what we call obedience. No matter how we feel that is subject to the reality of his truth. And so when you go through it, it really is painful for a period of time. Peter is a great example of that. I'm never going to leave you. I'll fight for you. Now you have to think about how that feels, the determination to say that. I don't think Peter said, you know, whatever happens, I'm, I'm for you. I'll be there for you. I don't think it was with that manner of, of, of expression. I think it was very solidly, determinedly, this is how it will be. But he didn't know what was in him, how weak his flesh was. So when he denied knowing Christ or being part of Jesus' ministry, a disciple, when he dis- denied that, he didn't have to think about denying it. It came out of what was in him. So what came out, so what was in him had to die. It's this death, resurrection on a daily basis is what we experience. And Jesus even mentions that in his teaching. You have to pick up your cross daily. And wouldn't it be nice if we just got a day off? I wish he would have said, you have to pick up your cross Monday through Friday. Weekend, you can do whatever you want, have whatever you want. That's what the flesh, yeah, it's just when I, when I get to the end of the rope and I can't go on and I'm looking for a, 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 a window of opportunity where I can just relax and I arrive at that window of opportunity only to find that I need to rise to the occasion, that's when I get really upset. But that's the mind of the flesh trying to figure out when I can rest. Only God knows that. I don't know. Is this making sense? It goes very, very deep in terms of discipleship. And unfortunately, as I was talking to my friend, his name is Steve, too. He said, uh, because he he has done ministry in in, uh, other areas of the world. Well, Julie has as well. American Christianity is unfortunately within the context of prosperity. And it's very hard to get spiritual roots when you're very prosperous. It's not, it's not impossible, but it's very difficult. And it tends to get spirituality, in this case Christianity, that he compares to, well, to American football. Everybody has their teams. We're Catholics, we're Lutherans, we're this. And they root for their team. And then the professional people are the ones playing the game. It's kind of like that. I mean, that's how I was raised. I, I, I didn't really, my discipleship as I understood it was to be a good church member and to fulfill whatever duties needed to be done to keep the institution going. But um, I, I just wasn't, you know, expected, expected much. Tithe, show up, better than nothing. Um, but the real discernment was to the professionals. And that's not how it was intended here, you see. So this bringing back together between the spiritual and the physical, 
Um, we have it in we have it in in in, in chapter six. Uh, we have it. Let's take a look at. Um, let's go forward a few uh, chapters. Um, oh, let's go. Let's see. Um, let's go to um, chapter fourteen. Now, this is the fir- first of three chapters before he's killed. All right. Thomas in verse 5. Thomas said to him, Lord, we, we, we don't know where you're going, so how can we know the way? Jesus answered, I am the way and the truth and the life. No one comes to the Father except through me. If you really knew me, you would know my Father as well. From now on, you do know him and have seen him. So there's the physical again. Philip said, Lord, show us the Father, and that will be enough for us. It's not the first time. Philip is a very physical person. Oh, this is great. Show us. Show us. Back in, in when Jesus feeds the 5,000, he Jesus is the one that asks Philip, hey, where are we going to get food for all these people, by the way? Philip, look at this. And, and the scripture says he, he only asked him in order to test him. Because he already had in mind what he was going to do. But in this case, Philip says, Lord, show us the Father, and that will be enough for us. Ever have that prayer? Just give me a sign. Signs work. Physical signs work in the same way that all physicality works. It's temporal. It, It doesn't last. Don't you think that if you were part of a million-member nation and you went through a sea that was split by the hand of God, that it would make such an impact that it would change your life? Not for them. They start complaining. Then they get food. Quail. There's a sign. They still complain. Because the physical only lasts for a brief amount of time. I can ask God for a sign. He can give me a sign. I can recognize the sign, acknowledge the sign, thank him for the sign, and shortly thereafter go right back into disbelief. So signs and wonders, um, they serve a purpose. But it's God who is working out the transformation of faith within our very being. It's, um, yeah. So, Jesus answered, don't you know me, Philip, even after I've been among you such a long time? Anyone who has seen me has seen the Father. There's the bringing together of the physical and the spiritual. How can you say, show us the Father, Don't you believe that I am in the Father and the Father is in me? Here's the key next sentence. The words I say to you are not just my own. Remember we started with word? Now this, this, um, there's two Greek words that we translate as words. One is the logos. It refers to God's action, etc. And the other is rima, which are the actual words that are being used, and they go back and forth. We, in English, we, we still use one word. In this case, it's rima. That's fine, but he's, re, but he's saying, the words I say to you are not just my own. Rather, it is the Father living in me who is doing his work. So everything that Jesus says, every word, every inflection, everything is God actively working through him to bring about this 
kingdom living. Every word. Believe me, trust in me, believe me when I say that I am in the Father and the Father is in me, or at least believe on the evidence of the miracles themselves. Now, I tell you the truth, anyone who has faith in me will do what I have been doing. And that's where you run to the bleachers. Because that's like, that's, 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 really? So, this bringing together of the physical and the spiritual ultimately will be consummated at the resurrection. But we are living as we go towards that time with that kingdom reality where the bringing together of the physical and the spiritual takes place within us. So God's Spirit is within us, working through us, and does so by way of transforming um, our lives back into uh, the spiritual first followed and directing the physical. Now, let's go to the beginning of John, realizing the greater context of what we've been talking about. Yes, question. Of what chapter? I'm sorry. Chapter 6, verse... 66, okay. Yeah. Uh, more than a few. I don't know many. They, ju they just use that term. And so, um, a lot. I mean, a significant number. Um, it's too hard to, well, if you go back on hearing it, this is verse 60, uh, 60. On, on hearing it, many of his disciples said, this is a hard teaching. Who can accept it? He's talking about eating his bread and breathing, eating his, his flesh and drinking his blood. And, and, and there again, you're not going to understand the physical mind. At least we had, in this culture, a period where we were teaching the physical alongside the spiritual. So you could use language like righteousness. You knew what was right and wrong um, according to spiritual truth, not according to consensus or a Supreme Court decision. You knew what was right spiritually. Um, one of the guys that's over at the Baptist church, uh, not, not a pastor there, but a uh, black guy came from the Midwest. He uh, grew up. Um, and went to a Lutheran school. He goes, I was so thankful because I learned right and wrong, and I, I was able to stay away from the wrong. And he was very thankful for that. And I said, I was very thankful growing up in a Lutheran church because I knew right from wrong. I still chose the wrong. But I knew it was wrong. I knew what I was doing was sinning. Unlike today where it's like, there's no, you can't use those words. Uh, if there's something wrong, we should get you a therapist right away. So, um, so, so putting together the spiritual and the physical, um, many disciples leave because it wasn't making sense. And it wasn't intended to make sense. It's not intended to make sense in the way that our Paul uses the mind of the flesh, which can only, the only thing it can do is put things into categories and put them in, in some kind of order. That's the only thing it can do. So when we say or teach the scientific method, we are people to think along this line 
so that we can discover things about this world and put them in their certain categories, um, but it leaves out a, the, the spiritual language which deals with the unseen and deals with things of what we would call morality, um, uh, things that transcend the, the, the physical. Um, and, and, and from a biblical standpoint, it is the spiritual that is the foundation for everything else. So currently, this is completely upside down. And it, it, it's just completely upside down. You, you, there's, um, there's not an awareness then. And, and I, I, I taught this when I taught the, um, the educational history of how we went from having Christian colleges and universities to secular. And when you get rid of this, when you stopped uh, teaching this, Um, and you remove this from your educational institutions, now you don't have a morality, and therefore, or character. Character is another way to put it. Character. Being able to persevere, being kind, being patient, being understanding. These are character developments. You don't have anything to the fruit of the Spirit, if you will. You don't have anything to, as a, as a body of knowledge, to instill what that means. So you have to, what do you substitute it with then? When you get rid of spiritual education and you get rid of those aspects? The National College of Athletic Association. That's how it was formed. Because athletics is where you will learn character. Have you heard that? I want my kids to learn football because, boy, that's where you really learn character. I don't know if that's true. You know, but that's, that's where it started, by the way. It start, and I can give you the exact date. I have to look it up in my notes. But it came as a result of, okay, well, where are they going to get this character? Where are they? Well, we'll have, we'll have sports. Sportsmanlike conduct. That's even a penalty. That, you can't do that. That's unsportsmanlike conduct. Randy Moss. Uh, well... You know, if you have biblical, you know the arrogance is bad. So, it's, it's very important to understand what John is saying, and it, and it directly relates to, to Genesis because we cannot fathom a Genesis 1 and 2 with the mind of the Spirit. We can fathom Genesis 3 because we know what it's like to be angry with people. We know what murder is like. We know what violence is like. And we live in a post-Genesis 3 world. But God is bringing together through us his work, a com a coming to the conclu conclusion rather of the um, resurrection. And that is a very, very profound vocation, spiritual vocation. But that is the only reason why we are on the planet. That's how big it is. Otherwise, why are we here? Well, the answer currently is because of a random act of various atoms and development thereof. Okay. But that's going to leave a, a society completely bankrupt of any kind of uh, reality. All right. I'm going to stop there. And it's hard. It's very difficult. <laughs>
yesterday I was very was very I, I couldn't hear his voice. And it's been a long time since I, I was so uh, muffled that I couldn't hear his voice. You can, anyone can do this. We've designed it as a franchise. You don't need to hear God's voice to lead worship in a franchise mode. You just have to say the right words, right? It's all laid out for us. But if you're doing it authentically, that's a different th- scenario. And we have created within this body, our God has created an authentic, an authenticity, a realness that will not allow us to fall, to fall prey to a franchise type of, of religiosity. I mean, I've known you now, you're very genuine people. You're not fake. It's the last thing that you are. But we live in a fake world. So it's easy to fall into that. Anyway, um, let's pray. We thank you, God, for your presence here. Sometimes we don't know precisely what you're saying, but we do know that you are here. We do know that you are moving. We do know that we can trust you. And so as we go through this week, may we be drawn to your word, to your voice. And in the words of the song, the the hymn, the closer we get to you, the things of this life will go strangely dim in the light of your glory and grace. This we thank you for in Jesus' name. Amen. Have a great week. It's cooling off. <laughs>